Penny Matthew. I hold the Freilich Foundation Chair here at the ANU and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Freilich Foundation's annual lecture on bigotry and intolerance. Before we commence, I want to acknowledge that we're meeting on Ngunnawal land. I acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional custodians of this continent, whose cultures are amongst the oldest living cultures in human history. I pay respect to the elders of the community and I extend my recognition to their descendants who are here tonight. I'd also like to acknowledge that we have Mrs. Valmay Freilich in the audience and we're always delighted to have her attending our events. The Freilich Foundation is very proud to be hosting this lecture. Professor Megan Davis is our speaker and she'll be talking about constitutionalising racial non-discrimination why the expert panel on recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the Constitution recommended a racial non-discrimination provision in the Australian Constitution. Professor Davis is particularly well placed to speak on this topic. She was, of course, a member of the expert panel. But she also brings a wealth of other experience to the topic. She's Professor of Law and Director of the Indigenous Law Centre at the University of New South Wales. Um, and she's an expert member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And this year she was rapporteur for the Permanent Forum's expert group meeting on violence against Indigenous women. And she's currently completing a book on the topic of self-determination and Aboriginal women. Uh, so she's thought very long and hard about these issues and is well placed to speak on the topic tonight. So please welcome Megan Davis. Thanks, uh, Penny. <laughs> Thank you for that generous um, introduction. Um, I am an Aboriginal woman from South West Queensland, um, which I come from a place called Warra, which is near the Bunyan Mountains. And so as an Aboriginal woman, I'd like to pay my respects to country um, and the traditional owners of this land. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, the presence of Valmay Freilich in the audience. And finally, thank uh, Penny and Renata, and I'm not sure where Renata, and, and Jeanette uh, Murdoch from the Indigenous Law Centre um, for their assistance in organising um, tonight's lecture. So I, I feel very privileged to have been asked um, and to be delivering the 2012 annual Freilich Lecture in Bigotry and Tolerance. Tonight I'm going to speak about my own personal experience of being a member of the Prime Minister's Expert Panel on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Constitution. So I wanted to do uh, two things. First, I wanted to provide an overview of the expert panel. So what was it and, and what did we recommend? And then second, I wanted to speak about why it was that we recommended a non-discrimination clause in the Constitution. And I hate to disappoint the lawyers or human rights lawyers in the room among us, but I suppose I'm not going to answer um, that question in a, in a conventional way, but rather um, do what is perhaps uncommon experience for many lawyers, and that is to share with you two of my own personal experiences from my time travelling Australia as a panel member. One story about the legacy of racism in Aboriginal communities, and another story about the importance of leadership in non-Indigenous communities. So I wanted to share these experiences with you in the hope that you'll be able to walk away from tonight and it may provoke some thoughts um, and ideas about this process, but in particular the importance of a non-discrimination uh, provision in the Constitution. Now I'm taking this approach because I think that in the wash-up um, or the analysis of the panel's recommendations, there is perhaps a humanness lacking from the dry legal set pieces advocating for and against non-discrimination. Lacking are the human stories, the historical legacy of racism in Australia, the lived experiences that persuaded us as a panel that, constitutional, that a constitutional guarantee to non-discrimination is an important step for Australia as a nation and a critical step in terms of the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in this nation. So to begin with, I wanted to foreground my lecture with some initial thoughts. 
when uh, Penny first asked me to deliver the research, uh, the lecture, I did some research um, on the Freilich Foundation uh, website. And in particular, the wonderful work that Val May and, and Herbert have done over the years. And I came upon uh, Herbert's recollections titled Reminiscences of Bigotry. And, um, and upon discovering them and reading them, I felt an immediate uh, affiliation with him and the experiences he had encountered throughout his life with respect to bigotry and intolerance. And although his stories related to being uh, Jewish in Australia, I felt like he was recollecting the experiences and the stories of my own life as an Aboriginal girl, as an Aboriginal woman in Australia. Uh, and the introduction to his recollections reads, uh, my recollections of bigotry stories are disproportionately from a Jewish perspective. Others from different backgrounds would have different recollections. Bigotry is universal. It is the target that differs. And there are four stories in particular in his collection, in his recollections, that really struck a chord with me in terms of my life as an Aboriginal woman in Australia. So the first one is in his reflection. He writes about his first experiences of difference, of the first time as a child um, that someone identifies you as being different. And in, in his story, he speaks about being in school at a very young age um, and, and one uh, student saying to him that you killed Christ. And this is something too that I have experienced. I remembered vivi vividly the first time in a, in a primary school playground in regional Queensland where kids for the first time identify you as being Aboriginal, as being an, an abo, a coon, a bull, the language of primary school playgrounds. And this has a profound and lasting influence on you as a human being, on your thoughts, on how you view the world. So those childhood experiences, um, or kids, are one thing, but Herbert's stories also refer to teachers and doctors, persons in authority, people with power. And I certainly recall my first experience of a teacher, someone I looked up to at a school in Harvey Bay in Queensland, where at um, him practice um, at school, um, out of all the overexcited children uh, in the group, I was singled out as being um, um, a troublemaker. And it's these experiences where the, for the first time you know you're being singled out because you're Aboriginal. And it's a formative experience, these events. They shape how you view the world and how you think about race and culture and religion. But the third story that Herbert, Herbert shares is his first experience of being a bystander. Standing by when something is said where he wished on reflection that he had spoken up. Something I too have experienced, where you hear something bigoted or intolerant being said, and you stand by and you allow those words uh, to be unchallenged. Hateful, hurtful, ignorant words. Because you were scared, or because it, it, was, too, it was easy not to say anything, or you felt unsafe and so you let it go. But you remember those moments for the rest of your life, as Herbert did in his recollections, that he wished he'd st stood up, as I have on many occasions, and challenge. And you never forget that experience of being the bystander. And finally, uh, a story that resonated with me was a story Herbert shared about a couple who he and Val May's wife were friends with in a building in Potts Point. And he wrote in, his, in these recollections that we agreed on many things despite being Jewish and Catholic. But he said they were contemptuous of Aborigines and expressed antipathy toward them. Herbert recalled how if he and Val May tried to remonstrate, their reply was, you don't understand them. 
You don't know them like we do. You haven't lived with them. And Herbert wrote the following reflection. I doubt that they knew them in any sense of mutual understanding or acceptance. They existed in proximity in a manner guaranteed to bring out the worst on both sides. They kept their distance, with the stronger community making sure that the weaker knew its place. Until an explosion occurs. Until an explosion occurs. Powerful words. And I urge you all uh, to go on the Foundation's website and, and read these stories. Because sharing stories like these, I think, uh, are, is important. When I reflect on the responses to the expert panel's recommendations, I think the report is stripped of these stories, these human stories that were shared with us by Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians all over this country. And I want to return to that, to some of Herbert's reflections um, at the end, but they were really useful in preparing my thoughts for tonight. And I think Herbert's vignettes of the way in which bigotry and intolerance manifest itself in the way people think and speak are each a true reflection of the historical and contemporary experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia. Herbert's stories are powerful because they involve people and real lived experiences. And so that's why tonight I didn't want to get mired in the legal arguments for uh, and against a non-discrimination provision because while important and necessary to Canvas, I think they are predictable and um, they are automated responses. And I think in reducing the recommendation for a constitutional non-discrimination power to well-rehearsed positions on the undemocratic expansion of judicial review, judicial activism, judicial overreach, Mabo-esque hysteria about certainty in the law, I think it really minimises the contribution made by ordinary people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to this process, to this recognition project. Because I think, like Herbert's stories, each of the 22 members of the expert panel, Travelling Australia, were privy to these many, many stories of not just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, but everyday Australians on this relationship that we don't often speak about between black and white Australia. So we met those who abhor racism and discrimination, as well as a lot of people who expressed intolerant and bigoted views. And there were, I suppose, a vast majority who were neither here nor there, um, non-committal. But they all made an effort to turn up and contribute, and I think it is demeaning to the over 5,000 Australians who took part to dismiss their stories in preference of legal storytelling. Because I think these stories give us a really important insight in the, into the complexity of race relations in Australia. Again, something that's not often spoken about. So that were just some thoughts that I wanted to share with you. Um, now I wanted to explain in brief the panel process and the recommendations of the panel. And then to share with you um, what I think were two really important um, stories um, that assisted in, in persuading um, what was quite a divided panel on the non-discrimination provision uh, to recommend a non-discrimination provision. So to begin with, where did this momentum for constitutional recognition come from? So the idea of constitutional recognition is one that has been recommended by many bodies, many commissions over the past 30 years in Australia. And I think that's a really important point to emphasise, that the panel's work is not in isolation at all. So three decades, really, of work has gone into what, what we, we produced. So recommendations for constitutional recognition have you know, originated from a 1983 Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee uh, report, the 1988 Constitutional Commission, the social justice package that was negotiated after the Mabo decision, the 1998 Constitutional Convention and the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, there are many, many reports. And so this is consistent with um, uh, developments internationally, with comparative countries with Indigenous populations. 
peoples. With my UN hat on, I know that uh, most countries now have some form of recognition of their indigenous peoples and their constitutions. And that recognition around the world occurs in uh, different ways, including, but not limited to, recognition of treaty or land rights, recognition of indigenous culture, including languages and heritage, uh, designated or special parliamentary seats, uh, and a guarantee to uh, non-discrimination. So it was that in the lead up to the last federal election, um, both sides of politics in their platforms, election platforms, had a commitment to the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the constitution. And when Prime Minister Gillard was negotiating an agreement um, uh, following the hung parliament, the Greens and the independent Rob Oakeshott um, held Gillard to an agreement that she would seek the community's views on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the constitution and that she would hold a referendum before or at the next election. So it was about December 2010, a day before Christmas, that the Prime Minister constituted this panel. Um, it, it was a diverse panel to report to the government on possible options for constitutional change. And the panel um, had representation from all sides of politics. It had Indigenous and non-Indigenous representation, so it was ha half and half equal in terms of Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Um, and it included business leaders, uh, academics, community leaders, um, a jewellery maker. It was quite a diverse um, um, panel. And, and certainly by no means um, uh, in agreement on many, many issues at, from the outset. But um, I suppose that's why it's so important then that the final report of the expert panel was a unanimous report and we all agreed on the recommendations. So our terms of reference was to consult, undertake a process to involve the entire Australian community um, and engage them on their views about what constitutional recognition may look like. The second part of our cons consultation involved legal consultation. So in performing its role, the panel was to have regard to the implications of any proposed changes to the constitution and to seek advice from constitutional law experts. So that was important in the context of unintended consequences. Um, and I'll, as I'll discuss later, um, one of the problems of the 1967 referendum was that the, the, the drafting uh, uh, meant that there were unintended negative consequences for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So for the course of last year, 2011, we adopted a number of approaches to try and get from the Australian people what it is they might think about this issue. So we published a discussion paper, um, a website was set up and, and all of those young people things like Twitter and Facebook and to, to get um, the, the youth involved in this um, uh, movement. Um, but importantly, over a period of five months, we held a public meetings and, and events uh, uh, or consultation around the country. Um, and, I, and I'll just add in that we also had a short film that discussed the dis uh, or described the discussion paper, but it was and it was translated into 15 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages. So we ensured that where it was necessary, we had translators at the consultations in remote communities. Um, the final thing before I uh, speak to the recommendations is that from the outset when we met, we realised that we would have to come up with some methodology as to how we would assess suggestions and, for, uh, and proposals for constitutional uh, amendment. And so um, we agreed on four <laughs> principles to guide our assessment in relation to each proposal. Those four principles were that um, each recommendation or proposal must contribute to a more unified and reconciled nation. The second principle was that it must be of benefit and accord with the wishes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Third, that each proposal must be capable of being supported by an overwhelming majority of Australians from across the political, political and social spectrums. And fourth, that each uh, proposal or recommendation be technically and legally sound. 
So, for example, the third principle, be capable of being supported by an overwhelming majority of Australians. Of course, this is as a consequence of our rigid constitution that requires um, a national majority and a majority of states. Um, and it is for that reason that we did not make any recommendation um, or, or, or deliver any proposal around sovereignty or treaty because we knew that it would not be capable of getting the full support of the Australian population to get the referendum across the line. Um, so on the 19th of January, the panel this year handed its report to the Prime Minister. So, and I'm happy to, in question time, to speak about where that is um, because there has not been any formal response um, except for a suggestion for an act of recognition. So there were essentially five recommendations and I believe Tristan's handed out um, the recommendations to everyone and I won't take you all uh, through it in verse. Um, I just wanted to give you an idea of what they were, what they look like. Um, so um, quite simply, the first recommendation is that section 25 be repealed. Um, so there's multi-party support for the deletion of section 25 and universal agreement among commentators that it, that it should be deleted. Um, in terms of recommendation two, it is that section 5126 be repealed. So section 5126 is commonly referred to as the race power and many will recall that this is the power that was amended in the 1967 referendum. Um, so in 1967, we removed the words other than the Aboriginal people of any state. And what that meant was that it conferred upon the federal parliament the power to make laws for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, but it was in the course of our deliberations that it became apparent that there was near universal agreement in the legal community that the race power was a head of power that could permit the federal parliament to pass laws intended for both the benefit and the detriment of a people of any race. So the fact that it could be used in an adverse uh, fashion against a people of any race means that the federal parliament has the power to make laws uh, or discriminatory laws against indigenous peoples. And I know in, at the University of New South Wales, um, our students are often reminded when teaching the race power of the exchange in the High Court uh, 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 decision, uh, or sorry, case of Cartagnari, where the Solicitor General, the Commonwealth Solicitor General was arguing that the race power uh, could be used both in a beneficial uh, and adverse uh, way. And I think it was Justice Kirby who asked the Commonwealth Solicitor General, well, you know, are you saying then that the race power could be used to support Nazi-like laws in Australia? And the Commonwealth Solicitor General replied, yes, it, yes, it would. So we recommended that Section 5126 be repealed and be replaced with a new head of power called Section 51A. Section 51A is designed as a replacement to the race power and is designed to do two things. It includes a statement of recognition and it contains the new head of power. So the statement of recognition is the introductory words to a new head of power um, replacing the race power. And as you can see um, before you, it took a very long time to come up with that statement of words there. But the introductory statement reads, recognising that the continent and its islands are now known as Australia were first occupied by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, acknowledging the continuing relationship of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples with their traditional lands and water, waters, respecting the continuing cultures, languages and heritage of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and then finally acknowledging the need to secure the advancement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and then you have the head of power. So it is the fourth um, a recital that is um, what we use to qualify the head of power. So the idea is to draft a new provision in a way that uh, 
the head of power can only be used for beneficial legislation. Um, the fourth recommendation of the panel was that a new section 116A be inserted, um, so the prohibition of racial discrimination. And finally, recommendation five, that a new section 127A be inserted, um, which is the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages. So why did we recommend a non-discrimination power? I'll leave the technical part to the end, but as I mentioned at the outset, we had the privilege as members of the panel to travel to some amazing communities um, around Australia. Um, I was fortunate to travel to um, communities such as Nullanboy, Weeper, Thursday Island, Palm Island, Longreach, Mount Isa. And one community that really inspired the panel um, and our deliberations was the community of Sherberg in South East Queensland. Sherberg is an Aboriginal community that in 1901 became an Aboriginal settlement uh, or mission or reserve as they were known um, under the Aboriginal Protection Act. So this was during the Protection Era. And under the Protection Act, um, Aboriginal groups from all over Queensland and some from North New South Wales were moved to Sherberg. So the Protection Era is this period in Australian history where government, uh, administration, controlled every aspect of Aboriginal people's lives. It controlled uh, who and when they married, who they could work for, if they could work, where they travelled to, so their freedom of movement was controlled, what they could wear, what they were able to eat, and especially what language they could speak. And life on reserves, on many reserves, was uh, pretty brutal. And in Sherberg, um, the punishment, if you broke uh, the protection laws, was that you were sent to other um, remote reserves, such as on Palm Island or um, the community of Warrabinda. So we rocked up to Sherberg on a really cold Queensland day. It was cold because it's in the mountains. And we were met by some really, truly incredible uh, Aboriginal, Aboriginal women. And these Aboriginal women had undertaken an activity over a period of a number of years of restoring their ration shed. So the ration shed was where the weekly rations during the protection era came from. The sugar and the flour, um, the meat and the sago. And for many, many, many years in Sherberg, the ration shed had just languished out in a paddock. It had just sat in a paddock um, and was overgrown by plants and grass. And, and what this community has done has reclaimed the ration shed they renovated the ration shed and they turned it into a cultural precinct, which is now the heart of Sherberg. And Sherberg has, as we probably all know, a very troubled history. What you would expect when you remove groups from different areas of Queensland and New South Wales and put them all in the same reserve, and then you deprive them of fundamental human rights, the right to speak, the right to travel, the right to move, And it's really turned itself around uh, as a model community. It still has problems and it struggles, but I think it's really symbolic the way in which the town has reclaimed and restored the old ration shed, the symbol of racism and intolerance and bigotry in Australia. And we had uh, held our consultations in Sherberg at the ration shed. And one woman who really inspired us and whose story I'd like to share with you is that of a woman uh, called Auntie Beryl, who was 81 when we consulted with her last year. 
And Auntie Beryl Gambrell was born at Palm Island in 1930. And she grew up with her eight brothers and sisters on Sherbourg. She attended Sherbourg State School from grade one to six and then did grade seven in Maryborough. Um, her parents knew that she was a very smart uh, girl and she was very good at school. And when she completed her schooling, she returned to Sherbourg and had numerous jobs, including working at the Sherbourg store, the Sherbourg hospital, and then for a long time um, at the Sherbourg primary school. And she was offered a job by the Department of Native Affairs uh, in Mount Isa, and she took it and became a liaison officer um, up there. And she was an active member of Sherbourg Apex Club, the CWA, many sporting clubs. She was a JP, a member of the Barumba Local Justice Initiative Group, a member of the Ration Shed, uh, a PNC committee member, and a traditional owner of Bunya Waka Waka. And Aunty Beryl was so inspiring. Her family had told us she'd always fought hard for Aboriginal rights. She was even arrested in 1967 leading up to the referendum. And her family recall an incident where um, she was willing to go to jail to save the Sherberg historical bunya trees, where she protested with her ne nephews and nieces. And if I digress briefly, my own family, who comes from Wara, was moved to Sherberg in the early 1900s. And my grandfather and his brother grew up on the Sherberg mission but eventually escaped the reserve and worked around Queensland as cane cutters and timber cutters before settling in Harvey Bay, where eventually they bought freehold property and worked on Queensland Rail. And like Arnie Beryl, my grandfather's life was controlled by government administration. When we accessed his files, we read many letters from him to the protector of the mission, asking for permission to attend funerals, permission to set up a bank account, permission to marry, permission to inherit property that, was, that had been left to him. And Arnie Beryl told me in Sherberg a story um, about how she remembered my grandfather as um, the crab man, the man who used to bring crabs and fish up from Harvey Bay to the mission. And other cousins who grew up in the dormitories remember the Davises from Harvey Bay who got away from the mission and would send up fresh fruit and blankets on Queensland Rail to Sherberg. And because so many Aboriginal people worked in Queensland Rail, the fresh fruit was safely transported and smuggled into Sherberg. And so Arnie Beryl came to our consultation with a fully written submission, which the panel accepted. And people always say to us, well, I'm surprised any Aboriginal people turned up to your consultations because everybody suffers from consultation fatigue. Well, Arnie Beryl turned up on this freezing cold Sherberg day, a day when most of the mob had taken a better offer, which was a free meal and heating at the local Mergen RSL. But she had read our discussion paper back to back. She was conversant in the race power. She understood the damage that racial discrimination had done to her community and to Aboriginal communities around Australia. She really moved members of the expert panel because of her lived experience. And Auntie Beryl was so optimistic, despite everything she had seen, uh, she said she had turned up because she thought constitutional recognition was important. She said she wouldn't see it in her lifetime, but she said that she wanted it for her kids, her grandkids and her great-grandkids. She said it matters. She thought younger kids might eschew it for more short-term political gains. But as we sat on the veranda of the ration shed, Auntie Beryl said, uh, after all this mob has been through, has been put through by this country, the lack of dignity, the humiliation, we deserve some recognition. But we are also entitled to a commitment from the state, a guarantee that we can't be discriminated anymore because we are Aboriginal. And Arnie Beryl had every right to be cynical, but she wasn't bitter or angry. She was optimistic, but she was also tired. 
You know, she had been fighting for years. She's seen the reserve system come and go. She's seen representative bodies, ATSIC, come and go. She saw the promise of a treaty come and go. She's seen the reconciliation process come and go. And the brief biography that I read out to you before is an, is an extract from a Queensland Hansard uh, report. Because Auntie Beryl passed away earlier this year. We quoted her in our report and her picture is in our report because we wanted to acknowledge the contribution of this incredible Aboriginal woman who turned up at the expert panel discussion with her discussion paper underlined and dog-eared and clutching a constitution in her hand, with, even with different heads of powers underlined. And people often say to me, as they have all year since we've handed down the report, oh, I think Aboriginal people must have been coerced into non-discrimination. Oh, I think I'm surprised anyone turned up. Aboriginal people have better things to do than than uh, do consultations on constitutional reform. Um, how did Ab Aboriginal people understand what it was that you were talking about? These things are so complex. But I find, and I found around the country, people like Arnie Beryl, our community has a very strong knowledge of law and history in Australia. And we found that they had a much stronger um, uh, knowledge of law and history than many of the non-Indigenous Australians that we consulted, and, and of course we must, because our whole lives have been defined by the law. Our stories are told and now retold through the prism of Western law. Yet we found that communities, by word of mouth or, or reading, knew about cases like Cartinuri. They knew about the race power, and they knew about a non-discrimination power. And it was communities like Sherberg and the experiences of meeting people like Auntie Beryl that really moved the panel. A panel that, can I say, was by no means supportive of a non-discrimination clause. And I recall an early meeting where, without attribution, there were very set positions that non-discrimination was a backdoor bill of rights, that non-discrimination was a bill of rights. But it was quite a journey to witness some of my fellow, uh, perhaps more conservative panel members, change their minds. From what? From meeting people. From meeting people who ordinarily they would never meet. From speaking to people and hearing their stories. And from experience, from learning the lived experience of people like Auntie Beryl, they began to understand Aboriginal people. And that is why stories are so important. In fact, some of the Conservative members ended up sounding a little bit like radical Aboriginal activists by the end of it, but that's for a whole other speech. The second story, so the first story I wanted to speak about in the context of the legacy of racism in Australia, because for many members of the panel, they'd never witnessed it or seen what that looks like until they travelled there and until they spoke to people. The second story is one about non-Indigenous leadership. And this is the story of a particular mayor from a very rural pastoral area of Queensland. And a number of us flew uh, to this very remote place by plane. I'm not going to name it. But as we waited for the mayor to arrive and commence the uh, consultations, another councillor came in who was coming to the consultation. And, and she arrived with papers and looking very hectic, probably like I did when I arrived this afternoon. And she avoided me and went, made a beeline straight for my white non-Indigenous colleague on the panel and kind of sidled up to him and we said, oh, I'm ready for this. They've got to be joking, don't they? Recognition. What for? What the hell are they doing here? And she had a folder, um, which I suspect was some dossier perhaps of statistics of Indigenous youth crime or, or, or whatever, but she was prepared uh, for a fight. And it was very tense. And then the mayor arrived. Jeans, Cobra, Aaron Williams, a very picture of a, of a rural Queensland <laughs> mayor. And he was sat down and, and the first thing he said was, well, 
you know, this town is pretty racist. This is a racist town. And the councillor next to him looked shocked. She kind of sat up indignant and said, what, what do you think? Do you think the town's racist? And he said, yeah, yes, yeah, of course. But in a very quiet and measured way, he told a story of this Queensland town that has struggled with race relations, that was racist, but there were many stories he shared of how Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people had come to live and work together in this town. He spoke of his own connection to the Aboriginal community, the things that he had done to support local Aboriginal kids in their schooling and in, in jobs over his lifetime. He said Aboriginal people had made an important contribution to the town, but especially the pastoral industry, a contribution that is unacknowledged. Well, it was quite an experience. And Jeanette's heard me tell this story before. I had goosebumps because it was such a powerful speech that he gave. But what was more powerful was how you noticed the councillor's body language change. So when she spoke, her voice was much softened than when she first came in the room. And rather than be adversarial, she said, yes, Aboriginal people have been a really important part of our property and our lives too. We've always hired Aboriginal boys in our yards. And she went on to speak really eloquently about the contribution that the local Aboriginal community had made to her pastoral property and surrounding properties. What was interesting in this was how she came in ready to launch into an adversarial position on the recognition issue. How shocked she was when the mayor said, quite frankly, yeah, it's a racist town. But because he had spoken about his personal experiences with Aboriginal people and the contribution that Aboriginal people had made to that town, you could see her thinking then about what contribution Aboriginal people had made to her lives and what contribution she had made to Aboriginal people's lives. She truly believed the town wasn't racist and that its residents weren't intolerant of blackfellas. But I was struck by how much leadership matters. How this one man was able to tell it how it was, speak frankly about the racism, but also speak about his relations with Aboriginal people in terms of contribution and achievement, to speak about them in a positive way. And the councillor had abandoned her preordained position and thought differently about her experiences with Aboriginal people. She thought not of the news reports and the papers, but of the personal, of her own personal interactions. And I suppose I was reminded of one of Herbert's stories in his recollection of the couple at Potts Point, where they said, you don't understand. You don't know them like we do. You haven't lived with them. And rightly, Herbert, as I do, ask, well, do you really know them in the sense of mutual understanding or acceptance? Have you really lived with them? Well, as it works out, the mayor and the councillor had really lived with them. But the mayor and the councillor had two very different perspectives. And it took his leadership to change the way she viewed them. That she actually did know them, but not in the way that she thought. Like the mayor, she, she did know them, but not in the way that she thought. And I think that that was a really telling story about leadership in Australia. Both in the context of racism and the relationship between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and non-Indigenous Australia, white Australia, Australians. But also in the context of 
for the non-discrimination provision that we did recommend. Everyone said Labor won't accept a non-discrimination power. Everyone said that the Liberal Party won't accept a non-discrimination power. And there is this resignation that, well, if they don't accept it, then there's no use recommending it. And I think that that is really telling in terms of the absence of leadership politically in Australia, the lack of courage. The idea that we don't pursue a non-discrimination guarantee because there are no champions in, in the parliament. Do you abandon the advocacy for a non-discrimination guarantee because of the short-termism of Australian politics. So they were just two stories that I wanted to share with you, the story of Arnie Beryl and Sherberg and the story of the mayor. And I should wrap up, but the fact is, is that the submissions to the panel overwhelmingly supported a racial non-discrimination provision. The submissions argued overwhelmingly in favour of the principle of racial equality. And quite simply, it was our job as an expert panel, our terms of reference, to reflect what it was that the community was thinking. And I hope that my two stories illustrate, um, given its extensive consultations with communities, I suppose the insight that the panel developed into the devastating impact of discriminatory policies upon Aboriginal communities, but also the importance of leadership in tackling the issue of race in Australia, but more importantly, in the advocacy for a constitutional guarantee to non-discrimination. The view of the panel is that such a provision is reasonable. We know there's a practical need for this based on real experience of Indigenous people of discrimination at the hands of the Commonwealth. And I think the Native Title Act, the WIC amendments, uh, the Northern Territory emergency, re emergency Response, these are the commonly cited examples in community consultations in Aboriginal communities. But it has been a critique that non-discrimination is not recognition. But I would just repeat the view of one of our panel members, the director of the Cape York Institute, Noel Pearson, who very powerfully has argued that elimination of racial discrimination is inherently related to Indigenous recognition. Because Indigenous people in Australia, more than any other group, have suffered much racial discrimination in the past. So extreme was the discrimination against Indigenous people, it initially even denied that we existed. Hence, Indigenous Australians were not recognised. Then, Indigenous people were explicitly excluded in our constitution. Still, today, we are subject to racially targeted laws with no requirement that such laws be beneficial and no prohibition against adverse discrimination. So we believed very strongly as a panel that non-discrimination um, was an important part of recognition, recognising our history. And finally, last year in October, November, the news poll, uh, finally news poll conducted national surveys of Australians on the topic of constitutional recognition. The final news poll survey confirmed that, as at 28th October, 80% of respondents were in favour of amending the constitution so that there is a new guarantee against laws that discriminate on the basis of race, colour or ethnic origin. That's 80% of Australians polled. And that was higher than any of our other recommendations. So to conclude, if I can end by returning to one of Herbert's stories, the bystander story. When he, as I have done, didn't speak up, 
but sat silent and felt ashamed ever since. And he said, perhaps the Freilich Foundation on Bigotry is the protest that I did not make 60 years ago. When I read that, I thought, that's really cool. Perhaps the foundation is the protest that he did not make 60 years ago. And when I reflect on the responses of ordinary Australians to the way in which our legal and political system, and especially our constitution, is imbued with race and racism, they don't think it's right. They think it should be changed. Their intuition is that we should no longer be bystanders, bystanders. That this is a positive move. But that is their position before politics becomes involved, before the well-rehearsed positions on judicial <coughs> overreach, crazy, undemocratic judges who are out of control uh, leak into the public domain and change the way people initially feel uh, about a non-discrimination power. So, yes, it is true, as many conservatives repeat, that the Constitution is a mere reflection of its time, that the White Australia policy is a mere reflection of its time, that racism in Australian history is a reflection of its time. Well, now, in 2012, 111 years since the Constitution was enacted, isn't it time now that we as Australians stopped being bystanders, bystanders, and make that protest today, that it's not okay that Australia is the only constitution in the world that permits racial discrimination, that it's not okay that we suspend the Racial Discrimination Act as it applies to Aboriginal people without consultation. Until we as a nation decide that this is something worth doing, even though it only affects perhaps 2% of our nation, then the question remains, are we all bystanders to the bigotry and intolerance of the state towards Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Uh, thank you. brilliant lecture and what a privilege and a treat to be able to listen to it. Thank you so much Megan for coming and delivering a, just a very, very powerful speech. I'm sure there are many questions and comments waiting in the audience. I have a couple of my own but I won't uh, jump in unless you're all too silenced by the brilliance of the <laughs> <laughs> speech which I think is quite likely. Uh, who would like to ask a question? language. Um, 
but that there is a sunset clause in that legislation. The idea being that that would force the next government, whoever that is, to to go to a um, a referendum in the next um, in the next government. So. Um, I'm not sure if I, I mean, as a member of the expert panel, I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I mean, I think it's important that it has been delayed. I don't think that you could, the, well, the overwhelming response from uh, the Australian community was that it was too toxic. Toxic was the word people used. It was too toxic an environment to take this to a referendum. People were really conscious that you needed both sides of politics on, on board. And I think, I actually think both sides of politics um, in my dealings with them, take it this seriously. So I think people are at pains not to um, to rush it um, and, to, and to do this slowly. So that's a non-committal answer. I'm sorry, Kim. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I wanted to enter this discussion uh, by the panel as you went through the process. Um, about subsection 2 of the proposed which is from 16 a um, Because my impression is that there are people who would regard an operation um, which is in favour of the, um, for the purpose of overcoming disadvantage mm -hmm. and so on for some group, uh, that there are people who would regard that as therefore discrimination against whatever group they belong to. Sure. Um, so, did we have discussion of that sort of issue? Yeah, I think that that came out in a lot of community consultations and in the panel consultations, right? There's this tension between recognising and giving power to them and, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then providing special measures for a particular group. So, I think that that tension is, is, um, is one that we discussed, that is that one that most Australians readily identify. Um, and it's one that's quite common in jurisdictions around the world where you have a non-discrimination guarantee with a special measures provision. Um, I suppose what we did get was a good response from um, many people in, in, in the community to the, to the narrative that, in fact, in Australia, we are quite accustomed to special measures for particular groups. So we have, for example, universal health services. <coughs> we have, um, although problematic at the moment, uh, a, a state housing commission. Housing commission. So people, when we went, discussed that with Australians, that in fact there's lots of things that we do uh, as Australians to bring people from this position up to the same position as the rest of the community. People understood that. Um, and I think... I think Hilary Charlesworth used to say this, that Australians have a really good understanding of economic, social and cultural rights. They have a good understanding of the importance of those rights and giving people a hand up so that they're at the same level as other people in terms of social mobility and um, substantive equality. She said the caution is just never call them rights. Um, <laughs> but so what, what you raise is, is, is a tension that's there and it's one that um, unfortunately can be very easily exploited in the context mm -hmm. of a... I, I just want to get if there had been discussion of the idea of having subsection 1, but not subsection 2, so it would simply be a very clear and simple statement, but then it would be too... Dark. It would, well, it would so. probably, yeah, I mean, I think then special measures would be challenged. So, I mean, I think that's, it's the same. Right. I was just wondering too about, given that religion is is often sort of interlinked to to sort of race as with Judaism and, and sort of Muslims, the way they talk about the media, uh, you think that they're an ethnic group as well. Do you think that uh, protection of religion would somehow slip, slip in under the prohibition of uh, under section 16, yeah, 116A1. There were a lot of suggestions for that particular guarantee, including gender equality. Um, I, I suppose in the end what we decided was our brief was about responding to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history and disadvantage, and so we stuck to non-discrimination, racial equality, and it, that's that particular provision is, I think it's 
model on the Canadian provisions, so it's very similar to the way in which non-discrimination racial equality guarantees are. Around. So we decided that, well, religion we knew would be extremely controversial. Oh, okay. um, and we knew um, that there were other things that would be really controversial. So um, the simplicity and, and, and for fear of controversy. Yeah. yeah. Well, what's more likely of getting up at a, at a referendum? Yeah. I think um, given some of the comments that were made in the community consultations right across the country, if religion was there, but, but isn't that already covered by other parts of the Constitution anyway? Well, they say, yeah. <laughs> technically, but not really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, lots and lots and lots of comments, fantastic. So we've got one here, one here, one up here somewhere, and one at the back there. Okay. Dr. Davis, I really enjoyed your talk. I'm sorry to raise a legal question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I'll be able to help in, in your proposed 116A Part 1, you're proposing that racial discrimination is effectively be prohibited at mm -hmm. all levels of government. Um, was your advice that an amendment to the Commonwealth Constitution, or there was a power in the Commonwealth Constitution whereby it could say states and territories you can't discriminate either? Um, <coughs> well, the, well, the states and territories are already covered under the RDA. Um, putting this in the Constitution was really about binding the Commonwealth. Um, and so that's why it got such a great reception in communities, because people liked the idea that the Commonwealth power on this issue would be curtailed. Um, so I'm not sure what that... Uh, sorry, my like, question was, uh, part one of 116A yeah, yeah. says not only the Commonwealth shall not discriminate, yeah, but state the state or territory, yeah. territory yeah. shall not discriminate. Yeah. Uh, the question was whether the advice you're receiving is that a amendment to the federal constitution, uh, whether there was a power to for, for the federal constitution to dictate to the states and territories what they could and could not do in this area. Um, uh, well, I suppose that's what they're doing to the external affairs power, mm. right? In terms of yeah, the there are already provisions on non-discrimination in states in the constitution, yeah. and there's the override power. Two, of course, in it's 103, and I'm looking at my constitutional law friend over here. The whole, I mean, the premise of our Commonwealth yeah. Constitution is about the relationship between the Commonwealth and the states, and yes. the Commonwealth has the power to override this. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is a constitutional state in relation to this area that would, in effect, be the, um, the notion of overriding the state. And it wouldn't be an unusual provision. I'm just thinking <coughs> about the non discrimination if they get residents of different states. I mean, that directly deals with the state issue too. So I think it would kind of fit in those provisions. But there were many, many more hands. <coughs> yes, Kate. Um, I was just interested in the notion of benefit. So I think it comes through really clear with the amendments that uh, you recommended that you know uh, laws can only be introduced with the idea of benefit and not detriment. And I think that's a really incredible uh, advancement if it goes through. But I guess I kind of have a legal question as well. When you look at the wording of um, section 116A2, and it talks about overcoming advantage, mm. I think uh, that can be quite subjective. And so I was wondering to what extent you think that this sort of amendment will protect against something like the Northern Territory it's, it's, all, it's all subjective. I think an intervention could still get up under these recommendations. That really wasn't. The point was to say to government, you can never do an intervention. The point was saying, you have to slow this down. You need to consult with people. Um, and, and I think uh, the, the same issue comes into play with the fourth recital of Section 51A preamble, the advancement provision. I mean, most communities we consulted appreciated that advancement could mean different things to different people, um, and that it might still result in laws that perhaps they're not unhappy with being passed um, that could still be seen as being for the advancement or the benefit of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So that we were really, we're conscious of that, but I don't think there's any way we can get around that because we were, we wanted to ensure parliamentary sovereignty, which is why advancement is in the fourth recital to 51A, that was a nod to parliamentary sovereignty. But we still wanted some 
framework around how those laws would be made. Um, so you're right, for the purpose of overcoming disadvantage, um, that might look different, as we know, with the intervention, as you said, um, to different people. But a big, uh, a common, I suppose, refrain we got from Aboriginal communities was that things happen too fast and, they, and we aren't consulted. So um, the idea is that part of this would be about government thinking twice before they do an overnight intervention into another. So people accepted that it might still be the same outcome, but at least they'll be consulted. Um, and the measures might be better constructed, which was one of the complaints about the intervention, is that some of the initiatives were positive, but really poorly constructed and really poorly um, um, implemented. Um, so, I mean, I take your point, and that's just, that, yeah, I mean, that's something that we community education around the recommendations um, and around the importance of having a referendum. So I think that that's an important ongoing um, thing because I suppose one of the, one of the, I suppose the messages that we got from all communities, whether they were Aboriginal or not, was that there's a really low level knowledge of civics in the Australian community. Um, but also a really poor knowledge of Australian history. And that was a real, real concern right across the board. Um, and so I think what they're doing now is, is probably right. If, if we can ensure that that money is being spent on those kinds of education programs that might lead to a better understanding of Australian history and civics, then that, that, that's a positive thing in terms of moving forward. I think. One of the important things about, say, Aunty Beryl's story is that so few Australians know um, about the protection era, really know that. They know about the stolen generations, but they don't really understand what it must have been like to live on missions and on reserves and have every aspect of your life controlled. And then virtually overnight, the protector who in Greenland was a policeman, virtually overnight he becomes the enforcer of the rule of law and you're supposed to respect him and, you know, I think, I think I don't, I, it, 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 it's, it's, it's worrying the low level of appreciation of, of what that must have been like for Aboriginal communities. Um, and of course the other issue being, as a consequence of protection era legislation, is the issue of stolen wages. I mean, there is a plausible explanation for the lack of inherited wealth and an advantage. People couldn't pass down money, people couldn't pass down property, people couldn't write wills, um, and people's money that they earned, you know, some people working for <coughs> 70, 60 years all went into a government fund and, you know, you had to ask for money for that fund, but that, you know, you know we know in Queensland where that money was spent, it was spent to bring the Queensland economy back into the black, as well as the number of highways and hospitals. But it's a great source of, you know, simmering discontent in, in, in communities. And I think that we would be greatly advantaged if there was more understanding in the Australian community about Aboriginal history without people, as they always say, feeling guilt. Um, Anyway, I'll just stop there. I'm sorry. Well, that's right. I want to be in the idea of just holding a constitution as for saying that 
teaching with the public, journey back from throwing millions of dollars. And it's all going down this little line where everyone's being corralled into this idea of just recognition. I mean, the whole idea is the Constitution is, is a document which is disadvantaged Indigenous people. It's a joke, it's a racist document, and it should be thrown out the window. And I think us as people should realise what it really is and just take the thought, take the leadership to our um, politicians and say, hey guys, you know, you're, um, you're just um, a bunch of thieves like the rest of the Australian um, convicts who came here with the Constitution, because that's really what it is and what it's done to Indigenous people and the culture which is here and instilled this racist document. And that's where I just think we should be thinking outside the boundaries of the, the actual guidelines that the um, expert panel was given it was there to fail and was there to disadvantage Indigenous people. These billions of dollars which are being given to this thing is just to keep the lid on the pot. It's a real joke. Well, I'm not sure if we failed yet. Um, I mean, I mean, I take your point about the Constitution. I think there's many constitutional lawyers. I think there's a general consensus that there's many parts of the Constitution that don't work. Um, and I think um, there's a growing consensus around the problems in the Constitution with respect to federalism, local government. So there, there's, there is, I think, um, for, for once in a long time, a growing consensus amount among constitutional lawyers about that, and Aboriginal issues as a part of that. As a, so what we have is, of course, a rigid constitution that's very difficult to change. I think AA out of 44 is the commonly cited um, statistic. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. As, as you know, people speculate, why is that, why is that? Um, and I think, you know, what we know is that out of the eight that were successful, is it had bipartisan support. Um, so I think if I was to say anything on the act of recognition, which um, the minister um, says is because there's low level community knowledge, I think I think history shows that actually communities are led by their leaders, um, and, and leadership is, is required. Now there's also this theory that was quite prevalent in the community that. The Constitution isn't changed much because Australians, well, don't know a lot about, there's a lot of apathy. Australians don't know much about their system. But also, Australia's a very affluent country where everybody's kind of okay most of the time, all of the time. And I suppose that ties into that bystander theory, right? I mean, I think one of the problems with this, and particularly with the high, high level support that we had on non discrimination, 80% is really high. And I think News Poll said if that fell away, like Start, some of that would naturally fall away with the no campaign. You'd still get over the line with that kind of statistic. But I, I suppose my concern is that um, in, in a way, we, we just do become bystanders to state action because we don't educate ourselves on how the system works and we don't educate ourselves on Australian history. And there's just a lack of engagement with those um, particular issues. And so it is left to the political parties who we all despise. Um, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> but, and, and they're not going to provide that leadership. They're not. So, I mean, how do we get something like this up? It has to come from Australians. It has to come from the Australian community. But we haven't... What, what does that look like? Uh, anyway, I, I don't know if I, I probably haven't answered your question, but... No, 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 I didn't really answer the question. just stated that, and um, I think that's um, said. And um, basically, um, I'll leave um, um, some applications from from ACT First Nations Political Party. If anyone would like to sign up, I'd love to have you... Um, Join the party. <laughs> Good on you. Thank you. <laughs> um.